Have you seen this comic before? It's the new viral thing. Yeah, I love starting each video with the newest meme, not just for the sake of timeliness, but because oftentimes a meme is a meme because it resonates with people on an unspoken level. And what lies beneath is generally worth exploring in depth. So, uh... If you're watching this video in 2023 because you've just discovered my channel and have decided to check out the backlog, sorry for the old meme, buddy. This comic has a filthy fence sitter saying both sides make some good points. The blue guy, enraged that the white guy is not dogmatically agreeing with him, decides to push him over. The red guy helps him up, and the blue guy accuses the white guy of siding with the bad guys. The joke is that the blue guy can't see that he was the one who pushed the white guy into the so-called bad camp. There's a few problems with this, of course. The first is that the white guy does have agency. It's not actually Blue's fault if white becomes red. Blue is responsible for what he does to white, but not what white does afterward. The second is that this is actually kind of an unrealistic scenario in my experience. Being in the center actually plays out a lot more like this. Yeah, red will certainly help you up sometimes, but when you criticize them, they often do default to behaving like blue anyway. I guess it's important to note at this point that the colors are American coded, with blue roughly mapping onto the left and red roughly mapping onto the right. And the original comic is meant to be a commentary on how the left's dogmatism often pushes people who are centrists or undecided or apolitical or whatever into the right's camp. While yes, missing the point that the right often does the same thing anyway. Popular reaction to this comic among your rank and file lefties proves the comic's point. So, if someone on the left is mean, you suddenly side with the racists? You are literally the comic, dude. Never say that Twitter is just a bunch of people making up a guy and then getting mad at it. If the straw man exists, it's not actually a straw man. I know people who are even just one atom left of center scream bloody murder at Stone Toss, but he also made a comic with the same point behind it. Now that the purity spiral has progressed, even lefties are finding themselves targeted for not being left enough. The thing that these same people told us would never happen five or ten years ago is now happening every it's not like it hasn't happened before either, where socialists threw liberals and sock dems under the bus as social fascists. Yes, that video's coming eventually, it's in the render queue. The purity spiral comes for everybody, but let's ask the question, why? Recently, ContraPoints got fucking destroyed online over a tweet, yet again. This time, the tweet was, Gen Z queer people are hard to figure out. They're like, I'm an asexual slut who loves sex. You don't have to be trans to be trans. Casual reminder that heterosexuality doesn't make your gayness any less valid. If you read this tweet carefully, you'll notice that ContraPoints doesn't even say that you can't be any of these contradictory things. She only says that she doesn't understand how it works. And that is apparently enough to be considered doing right-wing talking points by people more left than her, who are smelling the blood in the water. She responded with a five-page manifesto explaining her larger point, and despite the mucho texto, I did read it. She really sounds like she's holding back a bit of hate for her own audience here. This ain't the first time it's happened to her, too, and one of those other events led to her making an hour and 40-minute video about getting cancelled back in January 2020. Same thing with Lindsay Ellis. She's had to do multiple videos about all the shit her audience has come at her with before, going so far as to say that the left cannot name the problem that plagues it because doing so only gives the right power. A friend of mine named it the Beast, the name for this fear that we all live under but don't acknowledge. And over the last few years, I have had so many of my colleagues, all of them women, people of color, trans people, queer people, or some combination of the above, voice to me the constant anxiety that they live with about maybe saying something wrong that will get them on the bad side of their own communities. Every thought is a hostage situation. Is this the tweet that's going to sink me? So what do we call it? What is the name for this unspoken, unacknowledged culture of fear where we all know that one misstep can ruin our lives? This social media culture where we participate in the public shaming one day and become chained to the pillory the next. We can't even talk about it because the beast does not have a name. If we admit that this is a problem, then the right will just take it and run with it and use it to increase their own power. Same as they did with cancel. Same as they did with woke. Same as they did with fake news. If it has a name, then it has power. So it is a discussion that cannot be had. And so we do not have it. We say cancel culture doesn't exist and ignore this disease. Pretend it isn't doing real harm not just to individuals who are targeted, but to the state of discourse in general, and especially to individuals in marginalized groups, because they are always held to the highest standard of purity, and they always have the most to lose. It isn't even about saying something tone deaf or insensitive. A mere difference in opinion might get you fired from your job if enough people raise a stink about it. Lindsay Ellis is stuck denying that the problem exists, even as it ravages her, while being genuinely fearful of her own audience, because she doesn't want to give an inch to her political opponents. 
This has happened to Vosh multiple times. His audience turned on him over the kink at Pride discourse. Because despite the memes about him being a pedo, I don't think he's actually a pedo. He's just cultivated an audience full of pedos. Like their minds have melted until they don't understand the difference between bringing a kid to a shopping mall and walking by a Victoria's Secret and bringing a kid to Pride and seeing a bunch of dudes in leather fucking gimp suits being led around by a leash. The idea to me that there are people in in, in actual good earnest faith, making the comparison between those two things is unfathomable to me. This sounds like a trad take, not gonna lie. Uh, mods, you can just ban everyone who says shit like that. None of these people belong in my community, okay? Now, um, additionally, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, just absolutely, just purge, okay? Just, just remove, okay? These people, they don't have arguments, by the way. They just want to be able to wave their dick around in front of kids. His audience turned on him over the black supremacy is bad take because the sacrificing your principles to win ethic he's cultivated amongst his audience objected to that reasonable principled stance. There's no way to remove a large racial group from a country without genocide. There's just no way around it. You can't like... That's just not true. Like literally, I just gave examples of people in Africa who, uh, uh, like in Kenya, for example, like the way they got colonized people out is they uh, retook the businesses that colonized people took. And because they didn't have any economic interest in there, they left. Now that's still not separatism because wait. there's still white people who live in Kenya. So wait, they were able to... to... To be specific, when you say that, do you mean all their possessions were seized and they were destitute and poor and had no choice but to leave the country because if that's no, the it was case, businesses well depending on how much of the business you seize you can end up reappropriating the entire economic foundation of an ethnic group which is what we've done to black people plenty of times in this country so i know it works well at discouraging people from continuing to live in that area his audience turned on him over a relatively innocuous take on mindfulness because it sounded too bootstrappy for them and asking anybody to take any sort of responsibility for their actions rather than blame material conditions or historic oppression or whatever the fuck is apparently anti-socialist. Not bootlicking discipline, not uh, uh, suck it up and don't complain about the problems in life discipline, but the ability to take stock of what's in front of you and to steal yourself and to do it i have described what i mean by discipline there are people in chat who are willfully misinterpreting me because they are angry you people can shut the fuck up or you can get banned okay because i'm getting really tired of your contrarianism and fuck, I don't even want to go over how often this happened to Shu on Head due to her 2014 era association with Sargon and I's extended friend group i think at this point she's cancelled every day the thread that ties all of these events together is exemplified best in these comics. You might call it rules for thee, but not for me. You might call it a lack of principled standards, what that lack does to the community you cultivate, and how it always leads to that community consuming you in the fires of the purity spiral. And through examining these creators, by noticing the it's never good enough tendency among their audiences, we might be able to actually answer that question. Why does the purity spiral eventually come for everybody? Let me rapid fire a few scenarios at you, and let's see if you can put together what's actually happening here. One, New Mexico's tuition-free college plan would be among the most progressive in the country, but student activists say it relies too much on money from oil. Two, all of you fucking ladder-pulling, party-abandoning, centrist fucks. All you Ian Austins and Jess Phillips types. All you neoliberals, this is on you. It's on you. Don't you dare pass the buck. And don't think we're going away either, you twats. Buckle the fuck up. Three, a large part of the left is trying to convince the rest of us that we're wrong for expecting the most famous anti-feminists in the world, who also spread and supported the most famous white supremacists on earth, to own up to their bullshit before we accept them into our ranks, or somehow we're not team players who are willing to coalition build. IMO fuck these people. They are nothing more than sycophants who are simply trying to make themselves more popular without the backbone of doing the right thing. Let's stop pretending otherwise. And four, here's the Karlin Borisenko story. How knitters got knotted in a purity spiral, a process of moral outbidding is corroding small communities from within. It's easy to see what's happening on the surface. People are traveling down the purity spiral, demanding others be more ideologically in line with them, ostracizing them when they're not, and breaking friendships, destroying communities, and closing off opportunities in the process. Let's look at what's going on a bit more in depth. The first example is obvious. Progressives want free college. The underlying ethic is that they want to take the money from the rich to fund it, but because the rich earn their money in unethical ways, that money is now tainted. In the second example, left-leaning voters, in this case Labour because it's the UK, tell the centrists to get in line or fuck off. When the centrists choose to fuck off and Labour loses as a result, the progs are angry at being abandoned. The third example is a subtweet at Shoe on Head, one of millions I'm sure, 
where people who have non-left pasts aren't welcome on the left. After all, if you didn't come out the pussy reading Marx, you're not pure enough. And the fourth is just an example of that one rule. Any institution not explicitly anti-left will slowly become left over time, which I personally view as a reflection of the inherently subversive nature of leftist politics. In these four examples, you can all see the purity spiral in action, the continuing expulsion of those who are not like enough, until what remains is a tiny core of hyper-radicalized, impotent individuals who have destroyed the very thing they intended to subvert. But why does it happen? Well, here's what I think is the answer. Consider the current debate in American politics right now over the $15 an hour minimum wage. I think you might actually be able to craft a pretty good argument for it. You and I may not personally agree with that argument, but I can hear the logic in my head. The cost of living has gone up, but wages have stagnated. Inflation is slowly destroying people's savings and purchasing power. Worker productivity is up, but those same workers are still getting paid the same amount. These are practical arguments. They're not appealing to some ideological political theory about the innate justice of a $15 an hour minimum wage. They're talking about the current state of the world and how some things can be tweaked to be, in their opinion, more in sync with how the economy is currently changing. Fair enough. You can disagree with their position while still seeing how it's pragmatic, not ideological. And because it's pragmatic, there's also a limiter on their policy prescriptions, a necessary endpoint for them to reach where they can say that the job is complete. In this case, it would be something like, once the minimum wage has caught up to the rate of inflation, or once the minimum wage has resynced itself with worker productivity, then we can say it's a job well done. Now let's compare that with the discussions happening about the $15 an hour minimum wage in a socialist ideological echo chamber. In this case, there is no limiter on their policy prescriptions. There is no end point for them to reach where they will stop advocating. Because in terms of game theory, they're playing an infinite game, not a finite game. Yes, this is another video that uses game theory. I found it pretty useful now that I've been reading about it. A finite game is played for the purposes of winning. An infinite game is played for the purposes of playing. The reason America lost in Vietnam, and now more recently in Afghanistan, is because the Americans were playing a finite game. Their aim was to build an American-friendly state and eventually leave, while their opponents were playing an infinite game, survival. In both instances, the Americans gave their opponents a pounding, far more than they took, but they still inevitably lost. The socialist is always playing an infinite game. Their work isn't done with one minimum wage increase. It's not done with one worker co-op founded. It's not done with one market decommodified or one country overthrown. The practical reality of socialism, that collectivization must be forced on everybody all the time, makes achieving socialism an infinite game. There's no necessary endpoint, no limiter on their principles, only an eternally long arrow pointing in a unitary direction. And any step in that direction is automatically a good one, no matter what it entails. So, in this socialist echo chamber where $15 an hour is being discussed, there will be little practical consideration given to why workers actually need $15 an hour, or why some employers might not be able to give it. Their arguments will be as simple as working class good. Therefore, when somebody shows up and says, hold on, why not $20 an hour? Why are we stopping at 15? Then 20 will eventually become the new dogma. Worker good, 20 bigger than 15. There's no argument against it from their point of view because they're ideological, not practical. And if that's the case, why not 25? Why not 50? Why not 100? Why not 500? In this environment, the person who remains advocating for $15 an hour, the person who has not progressed more leftward over time, the person who has, to use the obvious phrase, been left behind by the left, will be cast out of the group as a fascist, alt-right, reactionary, Nazi, MAGA, Brexiteer, Trumpster bigot, even though he was welcomed and praised at the beginning of the game because he did not progress along with the game's infinite nature. In showing himself to have practical concerns about going higher than $15 an hour, he betrayed his practical nature to the others. He revealed his rejection of the ideological. What's funny is, in terms of game theory, playing an infinite game is actually preferable to playing a finite one. For example, a business built on infinite game principles ends up being far more resilient, because to play an infinite game you have to stop worrying about being the best or the winner, and start worrying about how to build self-sufficient structures. Paradoxically, chasing victory lessens your chances of actually achieving it. But the big downside of the infinite game is the purity spiral. If you can't convince those who are a part of your team to play the game on the same level as you, you will be forced by the nature of the game to do one of two things. Drop down to their level, which will end up being the lowest common denominator, or purge them from your team. And the more ideological you are, the more likely it is you will choose to purge. A team that routinely purges its own members can only continue to play the game using naked open force as they no longer have the popular numbers they once did. So, the Taliban is a violent minority that nonetheless rules Afghanistan. Same with the Viet Cong. And in their own way, same with the progressives. 
you can call it critical theory, you can call it social justice, you can call it progressivism, socialism, or leftism. But all of these groups and the people within them generally hate debate. Even the debate bros like Vosh or Hassan, now that they've established themselves, they're a lot less likely to debate anybody who can actually knock them down a peg in the name of not platforming a fascist or whatever weak ass argument they like to put forward. But that's not actually the truth. Underneath that excuse is the practical reality that their ideology is totalizing. It has its own set of ethics, its own language, its own moral code, and theirs is not the worldview of the liberal. Theirs advances itself virally, depending on us to play the liberal game of open debate, of tolerance, of the free marketplace of ideas. They play it because it's advantageous for them to do so, and when it stops being advantageous, they stop playing it. However, if we as liberals stop playing the liberal game, we ultimately become no better than them. Conversation and debate are part of our ethics, but it's not a part of theirs. And I'm pretty sure I can explain why. You ever seen nonsense like white culture is rugged individualism or emphasis on the scientific method or work ethic before? Yes, I will do a deep dive into critical theory on this channel at some point eventually. But in terms of this conversation, what's being attacked here are what a lot of the progs call the master's tools. Audre Lorde, a feminist activist, wrote in 1984 that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. What she's saying here, specifically because she's a black feminist, is that the tools of whiteness will never dismantle whiteness. Among progressives and socialists, this idea has become agnosticized over the decades to mean that the tools of liberal capitalism will never dismantle liberal capitalism. Alison Bailey, another feminist activist, following in Audre Lorde's tradition, wrote in 2017, the tools of the critical thinking tradition, for example, validity, soundness, and conceptual clarity, cannot dismantle the master's house. They can temporarily beat the master at his own game, but they can never bring about any enduring structural change. Bailey's point is that while critical theory is useful, it will never bring about the real change that socialists seek because it relies on the liberal's tools for its analysis. Those tools are explicitly named by Bailey as including soundness, validity of argument, and conceptual clarity. Her objection extends to all corners of epistemic accuracy, science, reason, history, and yes, debate. The master's house is liberal epistemology, and so the rationalist's tools can never dismantle it. We're swimming pretty deep here, so let's come back up for a breath of fresh air. The reason you've seen white culture is rugged individualism, emphasis on the scientific method, and work ethic is because they're actually talking about liberalism. And those are the tools that liberal society uses to build and maintain itself. In progressive theory, those tools can critique liberal society, but they cannot destroy it. And so socialists must reject those tools. If this sounds like, on some fundamental level, an appeal to irrationality, it is. Irrationality is how the rejection of ethics appears on the epistemic level. And so when these people say, fuck my principles, I just want to win, the natural end result of that has to be a rejection of reason. That's why there will always be a purity spiral, where the champagne socialists, the prog darlings, get cast out and destroyed by their own audiences. Their philosophy requires it. The liberal point of view seems to line up with reality far more than the leftist one. When there is this conflict with reality, the progressive and the socialist must fall back on the liberal's tools. And when they do, those who are more ideologically extreme than them, but who have not yet encountered that conflict in their own life, have every reason to turn on them. The purity spiral is not some sad accidental byproduct of leftism. It is a part of it at its very core. It can't not be there. If leftism is to be a revolt against liberalism, then on some level, it must also reject those components of liberalism that are most congruent with reality. This ever-advancing purity spiral is the leftist solution to that unsolvable problem. We are lucky that, right now, we're only seeing it manifest as Twitter cancellations or the odd firing from jobs. That's pretty bad, but as bad as it is, we've also seen it manifest in mass death. And personally, that's not a road that I'm willing to go down again. If a solution truly exists to this problem, then I think it's this. Be a liberal. Reject any and all totalizing views. The left is full of them, but the right has their fair share too. And as a result, they have their own purity spiral as well. Give the concept of purity its due. It is a moral foundation after all, which personally makes it very funny that leftists don't actually reject the concept of purity. They just replace the religious rights purity with their own form. But even as you give purity its due, understand that it is not everything. Again, reject the totalizing worldview. Now don't get me wrong, you'll still be canceled for it. Canceling is like coronavirus. Everyone's getting it eventually. But after you've been canceled, once you're on the outside, and you've cultivated an audience of like-minded people who are also on the outside, who have also been cancelled, who also reject the totalizing worldview, I think you'll generally find yourself in a better place, both in terms of your community, in terms of your friends, and in terms of your own mental health. 
Say what you want about me or Sargon or whoever else, but we never fear our audiences the way that Lindsay Ellis or ContraPoints or Vosh fears theirs, even when we disagree with them. All right, that about does it for me. Thanks for watching, friends. I'll be streaming some more Life is Cringe when this video goes out, so make sure you hop on over to twitch.tv slash gameboomers and check it out. It is a lot of fun laughing at that trash fire. Have a good day, and I'll see you there. I love you.